Let me uh, yeah, the record this. Sorry. Okay, well, thanks for having us. Um, it does feel a little bit weird because we gave a similar, very similar, if not almost identical presentation just a few hours ago, but that's fine. We got the wrinkles sort of uh, smoothed out. Um, so today, uh, myself, I'm Rob Otani, and uh, Colin Schles uh, in our sustainability group is here as well. Um, so originally, um, I'm really started as a structural engineer. Thornton Tomasetti is a large structural engineering firm. Uh, uh, originally based out of New York City, but we have offices throughout the world. And um, this is, by the way, did everyone sign up for uh, for your for credits if you need them? Um, so here we are. So we're all over the world. Um, we do all kinds of projects. Um, and uh, probably five years ago, we started a computational design group at the time it was called Advanced Computational Modeling. And really it was to solve some of the, I would say early design problems of, uh, at the time of our project when a lot of the ideas and the concepts and the responses that the engineer needs to respond back to the architect and the architect is getting also new information from clients when there's a lot of things going in flux and we need to respond very quickly. So that was the original concept of the computational group. And then it has since become, um, we still do the, that, that type of work, but it's also become an application development group because a lot of our people started to move into uh, actual programming and application development. And so we have a lot of different sectors or practices in our group. And again, we started with structural engineering but it has since grown significantly to all different types of practices, uh, which one being sustainability. And we're gonna be talking about that and how we work together. And again, Core Studio is a group that um, builds applications for all of these practices, actually. Um, and we're about uh, 13 people now and, and growing. So Thornton Tomasetti um, invests about a million dollars actually on our group and you know uh, we were talking about it today with some people here return return on investment and if you and if I actually would have put the numbers together it's it's a re return that is sometimes in not measurable in terms of uh, sort of what has, has so, sort of changed the way people look at our firm uh, in a positive way but but if I want to do it tangibly it's probably four to five times of what the company invests in the group so it's significant. And then Colin's gonna talk about the specific sustainability practice. Okay. Um, yeah, so like Rob mentioned, I'm with our sustainability group. And uh, I'm the principal liaison between the R&D efforts in the core studio and actual project application with our project work. So I'm gonna be talking a little bit about that relationship. Uh, so our sustainability group collaborates with the other practice sectors quite a bit, um, especially facade engineering. Um, you know, we've got different things about it, but we like to think of you know, the facade of a building as uh, the first part of the HVAC system in terms of energy use. But we also work with a renewal that works on existing buildings um, and structural engineering uh, in terms of embodied carbon. So really, um, and there's actually some other collaborations in there too, but those are the, those are the main ones. We work on everything, uh, big stuff, little stuff, everywhere in between, uh, all sorts of different market sectors. Um, ooh, that was a leftover one from SCB. Those are projects that we work with SCB on, but you guys have to do those. Uh, in terms of our sustainability group, what we actually do, um, we're about half and half certification work and what we call building analytics. Uh, so certification work is like LEED, WELL, ILFI, that type of stuff. Um, but on a national scale, um, we, we actually spend more time doing analysis. So code compliance modeling, different sorts of whole building energy modeling, passive house modeling, therm modeling, hydrothermal modeling, 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 modeling. So basically, you know, this type of uh, quantitative analysis in regards to sustainability considerations. 
Um, and then within our sustainability group, we take about 20% of our budget. This is separate from the core studio budget that Rob mentioned, 20% of our budget and allocate it to R&D. So we call that sustainability 2.0. Um, and this time goes to either developing cool new tools with Core Studio, um, you know, cross-practice collaboration, research on papers, stuff like that. Um, and so the stuff we're going to be talking about today is a product of those combined efforts, both the central Core Studio development and our own, you know, time on projects we allocate to do 2.0. There's our group. Uh, pretty diverse group here. Um, we're, you know, got a little bit of everything. We've got architects, we've got engineers, we've got building science folks, we've got material specialists. Um, and the advantage of our group is like we'll all get together and have discussions like wouldn't it be cool if, um, in terms of software development, that we've got Core Studio, which is filled with developers that can actually make that if a reality. So we will kind of take these these tools we dream up and, and make them into something that exists in the real world. And uh, today we're going to be talking about Design Explorer, which is again one of those products. Um, so before we get into the fun stuff with Design Explorer, has anybody here heard of Design Explorer? Anybody? One. Yeah, you need to count. <laughs> uh, okay, how about um, Grasshopper? How many people use Grasshopper here? A few. Okay, Honeybee. Who's heard of Honeybee? A few. Ladybug? Okay, cool. What about, what about Project Quackle? Um, good. <laughs> and real quick, how many folks are uh, on the architecture side as opposed to the engineering side? So architects first. Okay, engineering side. Okay, and anything else? Construction. Construction. Okay, cool. <coughs> nice. Okay. Um, so a lot of this came about, and Rob's going to talk about some of the early projects, but a lot of this came about because um, one of the Core Studio guys saw a video from this guy, Kai Chang. Has anybody heard of this guy before? Um, it was really cool data visualization stuff. So uh, I saw this YouTube video, and the example he shows was he takes his hand uh, and he wiggles all of his fingers. And each finger, when he wiggles it, moves in one of three dimensions, so X, Y, or Z. So he says, when you're wiggling your fingers, you know, that's a lot of data. You've got three different directions, five fingers, you know, 15 data sets that you need to manage. How can you visualize that? And so he introduces parallel coordinates. And that's this idea where each one of these axes going across represents one of those things. Could be your pointer finger moving in the Y direction. It shows basically you know, how much that's moving. Um, he's got all sorts of cool applications for this type of data management. But we saw this and we were like, wow, that's freaking cool. Um, he shows a live demo of it. And this is you know, one, one wiggle you can see there. Um, I did a little Wikipedia research on where actual parallel coordinate stuff came from. I was curious. Um, and it actually goes back to this guy. Um, I don't know how to say his last name. Um, but yeah, it's said before, I call him Phil. Um, he was a civil engineer uh, in France uh, a little ways ago. And this guy was the inventor of the nomograph. Uh, how many folks here know what a nomograph is? A uh, nomograph is just a quick visual computation thing. So you start with one value here, um, you connect to a second value, and it, oops, it's a touch screen. I gotta like keep a safe distance from this thing. Um, and it gives you uh, the, the third answer. So the idea is it's a really quick visual computation method. Um, it came from like early civil engineering stuff. So there's you know projects about railroads across Great Britain. Um, they do a lot of cut and fill stuff. So like you have to take this hill and like fill that ditch with that hill and then kind of move it along down the line. So there's a lot of these repetitive calculations. So uh, Nomograph basically invented that to allow you to do these really quickly, um, which I thought is cool because you know this is a really simple visual tool that now you know you know 100 years later we're doing this relatively exotic application with it, and we think it's actually like astoundingly useful um, when you take it not just from one cut and fill calculation, but to you know managing 15,000 simulations. This tool is extremely powerful. So we're going to talk about that a bit. But. Yes, so a little bit more about Core Studio, uh, just to, 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 to recap. Um, again, we, we build a lot of computational design tools. We do some software applications development. We actually do for, we do it for Autodesk as well. Um, we built a lot of their Dynamo tools, uh, Dynamo Green Building Studio, Dynamo SAP, uh, Dynamo Rebar. Anyway, so um, quite a bit of that. We actually get paid for it, which is nice too. Um, 
uh, just finished this 3D printed structure with Shop Architects, and we do some advanced modeling as well and engineering. And um, this just came out, I think, last week, um, you know, the next generation of AEC design. And of the 11 tools, three were Core Studio tools that we actually have moved, actually designed Explorer as one of them. But the other ones, we've kind of repurposed those tools. But, um, you know, so it's kind of, it's, it's telling that we're sort of on the right track in terms of usefulness of creating tools that are useful. If we didn't create tools useful, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have a group, right, in our office. So how we got started with our sustainability group, um, 2011, um, you know, our guys sat down, myself, who I'm a structural engineer, and uh, our, our advanced computational modeling group at the time, Yonatan, um, and our sustainability group, and said, how can we create a tool that we can, you know, sort of combine structures and sustainability in? So we created this embodied energy tool, which nobody was talking about at the time, which I'm going to demonstrate uh, in a bit. But that was the first sort of collaboration between our two groups. In 2011, we were the first engineering firm to sign up for the 2030 uh, commitment. In 2013, um, we started to work with, and up to, till now actually, uh, the Carbon Leadership Forum and MIT, which is looking at embodied carbon um, in the industry. Uh, and we've been releasing our project data to them. And we actually also built their uh, uh, D3 database or, or D3 uh, interface so that they can visualize all that data. So that's actually just came out maybe a couple days ago. Um, and then in 2015, um, I presented at the uh, AIA convention and we created a tool which was an R&D tool called GreenSpace. GreenSpace was a tool that looked at uh, embodied energy and carbon of a building, parametrically, daylighting and energy modeling. And so when I had seen the first parallel coordinates sort of system in a hackathon actually hosted at our office, I said, we have to build that. It's the only way that we can visualize that amount of data in one canvas was, to, was that tool. So Mustafa uh, Rosari in our office, who was basically the creator of Honeybee and Ladybug, was in Core Studio and I asked him to build the tool, him and Matt Nago, and, and they did. And you know, Mustafa is a super motivated guy. He built it in like two weeks. Um, and then since then, actually, um, Autodesk and admittedly have copied it and called, created a tool called Project Fractal. So if you see it, it's, it's, it, it's in their Dynamo Studio package. Um, you know, they make no qualms about it, but ours is open source. So anyone here can use it. And um, Colin's been, in, since 2015, building, build, building tools on top of it. So this was sort of, my slide's a little screwed up here, but anyway, so this is, why we actually did it because this is a graph that i had picked up um for the uh, years ago which showed this black line is the embodied energy of building basically the materials that go into building a building these are three different case studies of uh varying efficiency like operating system efficiencies of a building you can see over the life of a building the embodied energy of a building is really significant compared to the overall energy use. So up until like basically now, everyone's just talking about operating energy and mechanical systems and all these things, but embodied energy is significant if you're really talking about reducing your carbon footprint. And of the embodied energy, you can see that the envelope and the structure represents about half of all of that. So the concept being, if we can have some impact of reducing the envelope and the structure, in terms of embodied energy would have a significant impact to the overall carbon footprint of the building over the lifespan of the building. So that was the impetus of it. And um, the other reason is actually just came out with lead V4, actually has a whole building life cycle assessment, uh, set of points and structured enclosure because people have been starting to look at this issue. Um, if you can demonstrate a 10% reduction through the, your course of the design of the project, you can get additional, I think it's like three points, right? And so we actually offer this service. No one's bought yet, but because it's a new thing, but we do offer this service. So this was the first um, tool that we built in 2012. It was a parametric tool that calculated the embodied energy. So we're actually doing structural calculations in the back end. 
calculating the embodied energy for each material, steel, concrete. We actually have um, a replacement cement, uh, cementitious replacement there, changing the strength of concrete. There's a lot of things that are in there, and we built this, and everyone thought it was kind of cool, but no one really saw the usefulness of it because people were not looking at this type of metric at the time. So this was 2012. Um, and then fast forward to 2015, we created this tool called Green Space, as I mentioned. Green Space is a tool that looks at all of the, the aspects of, of the structural design, also the facade, as well as uh, daylighting and also energy use. And how do we visualize that in one canvas? This was the sort of workflow. Um, so we're using Honeybee, getting the weather data. We're using our TG structural tools toolbox uh, to calculate the structural quantities. And we're getting out of it um, the heating, cooling costs, and also uh, daylight autonomy. So I'm going to flash through this pretty quickly. But if you start to look at all of these inputs, the amount of use cases or, or case uh, design points is gets ridiculous. So, you know, again, we if we were to run this in Grasshopper, it would have taken literally years to look at investigate all of those situations. So, um, 95 years we looked at all those things. So we actually used machine learning, um, artificial intelligence. One of our uh, uh, programmers is uh, quite adept at this. And we took that same amount of data, and in about an hour, we had all of that data um, flushed through. So it's significant. Um, that was sort of the side project of this whole thing. The main thing was this, was that we had this data now, a ridiculous amount of data set. This is just a partial data set, just to demonstrate. But you can see, as Colin mentioned, here's the power of coordinates. They're sort of inputs and outputs. And each one of these lines is a design solution with a certain input and output. And then we were able to visualize, sort of on a canvas, those, those solutions. And so, Anyway, this was the first rollout out of the tool. Again, everyone thought it was super cool. This was like the only situation that I can think of at the time to use it for, because as structural engineers, you know, you don't, we don't do, you know, 100,000 uh, investigations. We do like, you know, five, if you're lucky, right? You just don't have that time. So, so Collins Group saw this, and they, you know, have direct sort of use applications for this tool, which is going to demonstrate. Okay, so um, with a lot of these tools in general, one, one thing actually I want to mention or reiterate, I guess, is that these tools are all open source. They're, they're all free. Um, you know, this is stuff that you can pick up and use you know, tonight, tomorrow, whatever. And it's been an ongoing discussion with the kind of our, our corporate structure, right? Because we're a 1,200 person engineering company and the idea of like giving stuff away for free is kind of atypical, right? You're not used to, you know, why would you give something away for free? Um, and there's, there's a couple of reasons, but one thing is like, as an engineering firm, we really deliver service, right? We're, I you know, live, breathe, eat, and sleep energy models all day long. So the, my experience that I can bring to a project is, uh, is kind of the, the value add. The tools, on the other hand, we can share with everybody and we kind of get free testing out of it in a way. Like you guys can break it, you guys can use it in ways that we didn't expect. And you know, all we ask from the open source I guess setup is that if you find something cool, like you tell us, because like we, we want to learn what, what you guys are doing with the tool. Um, but anyways, uh, so I stand kind of, like I said, in the middle ground between Core Studio and project application. So I'm going to talk about how we've actually used these tools on projects. Um, and I'm going to talk about how we've used the tools in the context of the kind of basic energy modeling process. So um, here we've got typical early design phase, concept design, schematic design, design development, and on. And I'm going to be focusting on this stage right here, where architect is starting to hit, put the pencil to the paper, and they're interested in quantifying different design decisions. So um, what sort of support can we give them as consultants? Uh, and at this point, usually we kind of take one or two paths, either you know, because especially early in design process, you need quick feedback. We'll either do one small box model, and we can use the box model to extrapolate results about the building as a whole. The nice thing about box models is that, like really limited inputs, so you can test out a bunch of stuff and put it to the bigger building. Um, or we can take a whole building model very quickly and 
you know, kind of get a rough sense of lead points and total energy use and stuff like that. Um, and I'm going to go over both of those, how we've used Design Explorer in that context. Um, but I'm going to start off with a project example of how we first kind of looked at Design Explorer and what the usefulness of it. And that's Upson Hall here. Uh, Upson Hall is at Cornell University. It's their uh, engineering building. Uh, we did it with Perkins and Will and LTL Architects. Um, there's before, there is after. Um, well, you know, it's a drawing, it's, it's in process. And uh, we were approached about the project before there was really any idea of what sort of facade this project would get. This is a, a deep energy retrofit, so full retrofit of the facade system, of the HVAC system. Um, it came to us and said, you know, what sort of early design support can you give us? And it was pretty cool. It was a multidisciplinary engineering collaboration between our groups. We had sustainability, facade engineering, structures, uh, construction support services, all kind of weighing in on this. So the first thing we did was we put together this spreadsheet that says, here are all your different facade options to reclad this thing. We've got, you know, terracotta rain screen, um, concrete panels. And then down here, we've got your glazing options. So we've got typical curtain wall design, uh, high performance curtain wall, thermally broken. Uh, we've got double facade systems. And we listed what the typical performance of each one is, uh, what the performance range of each one is. So if you're gonna go for like lead platinum or net zero or passive house, you know, how far can you push the thermal performance of all these options? Approximate uh, cost of the facade options. That was a big one. So facade engineering, our group uh, is able to cost these out. Uh, approximate weight, so what will the bearing on the existing building be, and additional sustainability considerations. So how much recycled content is there, how locally can you source these different materials. Our construction support services started to look at what it would take to assemble these. Um, as a uh, building analytics consultant on it, started to look at the thermal performance of these different decisions. So if you're going back to the original structure, what sort of thermal transfer will you have with these? And where it got interesting was this kind of core decision of whether we were going to keep the existing facade of the building and build out from there or blow it out and totally replace the facade. Um, and so the gun, our first gut instinct was like, keep the facade, <clears throat> build out from there, because you've got the thermal mass of the facade and, you know, it's already there, so, you know, save the materials. We did this batch daylighting study with like 300 rooms on this thing, and we set a criteria for where we wanted to hit in terms of daylighting performance in each one of these offices, classrooms, et cetera. And what we found was building off from the existing facade actually created a well effect. We ended up with this like mega deep facade, and you couldn't get enough daylight in there to meet your basic daylighting targets. So the decision pretty quickly was made, blow out that facade, keep good daylighting in there. It kind of had a compound effect. So we also had got a chance to eliminate these exotic connections back to the existing facade. So there weren't these big thermal bridges between there. Um, there was also less weight on the existing facade, so there was less structural reinforcement with it. And we found overall it was actually a cheaper option. So blowing out the existing facade saved money, you know, better performance, all that stuff. It was kind of a cool holistic solution. Um, but then, of course, once you blow out the existing facade, the next question is how big should, well, what should the facade be that replaces it? Um, and this is a question that we support a lot of design projects with. It's a really common question. <coughs> Basically, this one was, you know, how big should my shade be? Um, we had this wall effect problem originally. We know we need shading to manage our solar load. Like, how big should my shade be? Um, sounds like a really easy question, how big should my shade be? Um, it turns out shades affect all sorts of stuff, right? Um, shades affect your thermal experience of the space, they affect your daylighting experience of the space, it affects energy performance, affects views, um, it affects actually HVAC sizing also. Um, so there's this kind of, and cost of course, so it's this compounded effect. We've studied shades in like every which way under the sun. Um, at the top is like the real old school like SketchUp where it's like you look at 9 a.m., noon, and 3 p.m. and like Maybe. Uh, to the right is like Ecotech. You guys probably remember Ecotech. I don't know. I don't think it's in use too much anymore. Um, we started to get into one point uh, using these genetic optimizers. So there's one called Galapagos that some of the grasshopper folks are probably familiar with. It's basically like a way to create an algorithm to optimize for fitness criteria. So you know, you say, I want cooling to be this, heating to be this, daily to be this, give me the best one. And it'll run like, you know, tons of options overnight, but what we found was like the next morning it would give us these results and it was like, this is the best one, and it's got these like weird, you know, just like wacky results that we just couldn't share with the outside world. I mean, you can't like tell an architect that you should have two shades that are like this, right? Um, so 
we pretty quickly learned that the decision making process really needed to be in our hands. The, the, the process of deciding the best one needed to be in our hands. Uh, but we also needed something that could look at 10,000 options and make it so we could make that decision easier. Um, and so <clears throat> here is the box model tool that was kind of the evolution in this process. And this is kind of the latest and greatest for us. In two years, it might be something totally different. Um, but this is what's currently working really well for us. Um, OK, so box model. The idea of this thing is that there's an energy plus simulation hooked up in the background that tells you how much energy you're using. Uh, you can also do thermal uh, comfort metrics. From daylight performance, we've got day sim and radiance that is doing the daylight analysis on that side. Um, and there's, yeah, again, doing comfort experience. When we're analyzing a building with this box model, we want to be able to adjust different parameters, right? In this example, we want to look at room height, room depth, window size, shading system, glass properties, orientation. So we want to be able to take this box model and kind of move it around the whole building and look at what it's doing with different parameters at the same time. Like Rob, Rob was showing earlier, um, in this example, you know, with all these different options, you end up with a little under 700 possible combinations. When you're looking at energy and daylighting together, uh, you have about 5,800 individual results. So that's a lot of data to manage. How do you do it? Under parallel coordinates. So um, as I was mentioning before, the way this thing works is you have inputs here on the left. So these are things, here's your shade depth. Here's, uh, so this is the room depth, actually, uh, room height orientation, winter to wall ratio, and how many shades you have. Here's your energy results, and here are your daylighting results. And one single line represents, if you have this room depth, this room height, it's facing this direction, this size windows, this shade design, here's the energy impact of those, and here's the daylighting impact of those, okay? So I'll show it in the application here. Okay, so here's us sorting through our, you know, 700 some odd results. And in this example, we pick out um, an east facing room. So we're gonna go here, don't touch the screen, uh, pick out east facing room. Uh, we're gonna select a room height. We're gonna select a conference room for starter. Now this is sorted out all those examples. We're gonna go over to daylight autonomy and we wanna look at the top performers in terms of daylighting. So here, Selecting out the top performers in terms of daylighting, that gives us these three results. We click on them, you'll notice they're all 80% winter to wall ratio with six shades, 80% winter to wall ratio with three shades, 80% winter to wall ratio with no shades. We go back in, optimize for cooling. Now you've got two options. One option is I think six and eight. So if we want to look at a private office, we can make this room shallower. Now we've got these options. But let's say you want to look at chilled beams and you don't have the same cooling tolerance. You can lower your cooling tolerance here, which now sorts out to four options. Get there. So now we can look at 80% uh, winter to wall ratio with six shades. We'll meet that criteria. Uh, you can look at 60% winter to wall ratio with three shades, 60% winter to wall ratio with six shades, or if the project can't afford shades on the outside of the building. Uh, you can do 40% winter to wall ratio and still meet your daylighting and your cooling targets. So it's basically a way of doing these big batch simulations. And as the design evolves, as the process evolves, you can sort through all this data and pick kind of the optimal answers for what you're looking for. And you know, by the way, while I have this up here, this thing is a little bit smoke and mirrors, just so you know. Um, it's actually a lot simpler than it looks. Like it looks complex with like the parallel coordinate stuff, but it's basically like a glorified spreadsheet. Um, so if you get a chance to try this out, like, you know, please invite you to. Um, all this data up here is a CSV file that you upload in there. So when you sort through each one of these options, all it's doing is it's sorting through the options that you're selecting from that CSV. And when you have like a, a chunk from the first one and you wanna look at like daylight autonomy and you select that one, all it does is take from those results and it sorts those ones out. And each one of those results has a 2D graphic attached to it and a 3D model attached to it. So this whole thing is just a visualizer. Um, yeah. So um, next, uh, I want to show you guys this. So after we were using that box model tool uh, just to evaluate a really simple structure, we 
decided, okay, what happens if we import more complex geometry into this thing? Um, and the process is really easy. Remember, this is just a visualizer. So it'll take any results we give it. Uh, in this example, this is a school. I took out the name. And on this school, this is like very early design process where you've got a massing. An architect wants to know, okay, how big should my windows be on this project? What sort of glass should I look at? So here, um, we simulated some really basic options. Uh, different winter to wall ratios everywhere from 35 to 60%. Uh, different glass properties, 50 to 70 percent VT, 0.3 to 0.5 solar heat gain, uh, and looking at double pane and triple pane glass. Here's your energy results um, and daylighting results. But the one difference here uh, was that we added in cost. Um, so at this point, you know, because this is just a big glorified spreadsheet, we can add in any data we want, and we actually had cost information. So we coordinated uh, with the uh, cost estimator to figure out prices for opaque wall for um, high performance window, for a standard window, built that into the results, and here you go. So um, I think, yeah, this video is just kind of, at some point if I just move stuff around. Um, <clears throat> but you can see here, here's the inputs we talked about for water to wall ratio, everything to U value. Uh, here's the annual results uh, for cooling and heating. Here's the peak results. So uh, potentially use those for HVAC sizing. So peak results being like the worst time of year um, what is the cooling and or heating load going to be on the building? Um, and then daylighting results. We used a variety of daylighting metrics here, which I'll, I'll cover in one sec. And then, sorry, facade cost over here, too. So now the interesting thing about this project, you know, we've got $500,000 difference in facade costs. So for a school project, that's not insignificant. You know, if you're doing a high rise, the numbers obviously change, uh, but $500,000 difference in facade costs. So if we go to the next slide. Oh, yeah. Okay, so this is a little bit about process. So how would we look at a school like this? Well, for us, daylighting in schools is particularly important. Why is daylighting in schools particularly important? Uh, are you guys familiar with uh, HMG and their daylighting in schools and daylighting in retail study? Let's see, if you've heard of it before, raise your hand. Let's see that. Two, three, okay, couple. Okay, really powerful study. So uh, these guys, this is, what, 1999, yeah. They did a survey of about 20,000 kids in three different locations, so big old data set. And uh, they looked at the impact of daylighting in classroom spaces. So you know, with 99% statistical probability, what they found was that with ample access to daylight, um, kids improved about 20% uh, faster than kids without access to daylight. And they controlled for a lot of different factors, like they look at skylights versus side windows, access to views, no access to views, all that stuff. Um, and really what they called out was that I mean, if you're designing a school, screw energy, like make sure that you're providing really good daylighting in the space. Now, it turns out that really good daylighting matches up with really good energy performance at the same time, and we'll get to that in a sec. But really, daylighting is, is the most important. Um, how many folks here are familiar with dynamic daylight metrics? If I say that, raise your hand if you're familiar with day, dynamic daylight metrics. So it's daylight autonomy, useful daylight index of, okay, a couple. Okay, I'll go over it really quick. This is just a we always in our reports include this kind of smattering because there's a lot of metrics out there. I'll focus on a couple. Um, first one, daylight autonomy. So the old school way of doing daylight analysis was kind of a worst case scenario type of thing. It's kind of like a, an engineering approach where you take the worst case example, and for worst, the worst case example, it's gonna work for everything else. Um, the daylighting approach was you took a cloudy day and you said, what is the illuminance in my space on a cloudy day? If it works for the cloudy day, it's gonna work for everything else. Uh, we've come a long way in terms of computational power. And so now, instead of doing the single worst day, we take a climate file with 8,760 hours, and we run daylight simulations for all of those hours. And we set a threshold. So for a space, we might say, you need to hit at least 300 lux in this space, OK? And it looks at all those 8,760 hours, or just your occupied hours, if you want to call it down. And it says, what percentage of time are you meeting that threshold. Okay, what percentage of the time are you over 300 bucks? And it's one single number that you can basically sum up a whole year. So really useful number. Useful daylight index um, says not only is it important to have you know this much or more, you can actually have too much daylight, right? We're all familiar with glare, overheating, having windows that are too big. So useful daylight index says that same percentage, but it puts a top cap on it. It says you can have too much. Oh, and so lead V4 um, is now allocating points for dynamic metrics. Over here, 55% uh, uh, 
spatial daylight autonomy awards you two points, all the way up to four points for 90%. So with this school project, there's a little line here at the 90% threshold, going really well. And all we started to call out here is we said, okay, just tell us the results that are over 90% SDA. We want to look at UDI to make sure we're not getting too much. There's no formalized metrics for UDI yet. We basically say like higher UDI is better, right? That means like potentially less glare. Select out the higher options. These are these. And then if you start to poke around in here, what you see is that like this one's, you know, 2.45, you know, that's $250,000 less than the most expensive facade. Uh, keep on sorting through your options. And now, you know, even the cheapest option, the $2.2 .2 million facade, is performing as a top-notch daylighting performer compared to the other options out there. So off the bat, you know, the, the gut instinct is like, oh, high-performance facade is the most expensive option. Well, it turns out, actually, the most expensive option, if I, I wish I could move this thing around for you guys, but <clears throat> the most expensive option um, is actually one of the worst daylighting performers because you're overlighting. And what we find in overlighting scenarios, um, shoot, I'm missing another slide too, but is people put blinds down. So we also do blind simulations where we look at high VT versus low VT, high visible transmittance versus low visible transmittance. And if you do that all glass facade with like 70% VT, turns out that blinds are going down all the time and you're gonna end up with effectively a really poor thermally performing opaque wall that looks like some sort of mecho shade um, as opposed to properly selecting this. So anyways, moving on. Uh, what about thermal performance? So in the same thing, uh, we started to look at the results. And notice in the peak results, this project's in Seattle. Um, heating was negligible in terms of system sizing, uh, but cooling, we're actually looking at a 50% difference uh, from the uh, highest one to the lowest one. Um, it's, I don't know if I'm gonna find it right now. But we optimize now for cooling. Um, go through, pick the top performers. What you see now is glass performance. So we look at this, and we're looking at 0.3 solar heat gain coefficient and 0.7 VT. So we typically do a gut check at this point. Are you guys familiar with LSG? Does that number ring a bell to you guys? So uh, LSG is light to solar gain ratio. So if you take the visible transmittance of a window, say it's 70%, and you divide it by the solar heat gain coefficient, you get a ratio. And as long as that number is like below 2.1, it's a glass 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, it's a glass that can exist in the real world. Um, if that ratio is higher, like you know, if you have 80% visible transmittance and you have 20% uh, solar heat gain coefficient, like uh, you know, a ratio of four, like <coughs> that, so far that glass does not exist on this earth. Um, so yeah, anyways, it's a, a, a quick gut check. Um, yeah, so on a project like this, I mean, this is really just a first gut check. We we did this simulation, and I think it was like a day and a half, two days it took us to run through it. Um, obviously, we like to have more time than that, so we can like QC stuff and work it through, but um, very fast analysis. And next steps are this stuff that I feel like a lot of you guys probably know about, but looking at different windows, how big different windows can be, you can build that in Design Explorer. Uh, looking at cooling loads for sizing hydronic systems, looking at potential for natural ventilation, computational fluid dynamics, yada, yada, yada. Um, this is a, you know, I'm not gonna go into the details of this one, uh, but this is a very similar project we did for a tower in Brooklyn. Uh, developer asked us to look at the facade. So, uh, so we took a sample floor plate at the top. Um, the cool thing about this one was, uh, cool thing about this one was just looking at this top section of the facade, the delta in facade cost was $4 million. Um, so it's like that, I appreciate that because as an energy consultant, typically, you know, if I show that they're saving like twenty or thirty thousand dollars in terms of annual energy costs, I get laughed at because when you're building a building like that, twenty or thirty thousand dollars is like nothing. Um, but when I say you can save four million dollars by just optimizing this section of the facade, it gives me a seat at the table. Um, so what we're trying to do with this tool is build in more first cost metrics. It's actually we're finding that the the greenest building, the highest performing building, is not necessarily the most expensive one. And sometimes that can actually be a lot cheaper in, in the case of high rises. Um, OK, so uh, that's kind of our, our box modeling approach with Design Explorer and project work. Like I said, we also do a fair amount of whole building uh, analysis at the early stages of design. And so 
with and feel free to interrupt me with any questions too. I'm basically kind of coasting here. Um, right. Okay. So with home building modeling, we generally have two options in the early design stage. Either we will build a new schematic model, um, play with it. It's a you know a relatively time intensive process, but it's fine. You know we can bang out an energy model pretty quickly, um, or change the parameters of an existing model. So this is, I guess, kind of a it's like a controversial one to bring up or a weird one to bring up, but like the reality is, is we have a whole library of energy models that we use on all sorts of projects. So if a project comes to us, comes to us and says, you know, we want results in 24 hours, like we physically can't build a good model in 24 hours and stand by the results. So we will take an old model, uh, change the climate file, change relevant stuff about it, and produce new results. Um, one, benefit of doing that approach, changing the parameters of an existing model, is if we're looking at like, you know, a lead project, if we're looking at a passive house project, if we're looking at a code compliance project, all those projects go through a really robust review process, right? We do our own internal QC, we submit it to review agencies, uh, you know, the GBCI reviews it, brings it back to us, uh, code compliance agency reviews it, brings it back to us. So when we change the parameters of an existing model, Instead of doing something that's just banged out, instead we've got something that like, you know, 20 people with eyes and like an absurd amount of hours has spent like QCing this thing. So it's a it's a really actually good way to get quick, robust results. Yeah. But with that, can you actually, if you're saying like in effect you're reusing a model from a previous project, yeah. but are you actually putting in the new form of the new building or mm -hmm. is it really loose? It depends. Um, you know, some project types like multifamily are pretty consistent in terms of their shape, right? I mean, double loaded corridors, uh, you know, the project might be three stories and under. Uh, maybe it's a different orientation. We can change those things pretty quickly and get results. So sometimes we don't change the form of it. We'll normalize it to energy use per square foot. So you're not, you're not looking at the whole number, you're just looking per square foot. You can do relative values. Um, but if there's something really significant like <coughs> I don't know, you're looking at a project that, because of zoning, can't have any windows on the west side of a tower. You know, we'll manipulate the very quick energy model to have no windows on the west side. So like um, a lot of high-rise buildings, no, no two buildings are really even close to being alike. Right, right. So I'm wondering, um, in that scenario, are you in a situation where you can actually <laughs> take the, the paradigm of, of an old model and somehow uh, take the new form and mesh it together and like really make good use of it or not? Yeah, sometimes. I mean, mm -hmm. it's like it's a bit of a gray area, you know, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll use our discretion on it. Mm -hmm. um, so if we're looking at, let's say, a high-rise residential building in Chicago and the team is interested in the difference in performance of forced air, uh, VRF system, and, you know, four or five fan coil or something like that, we're looking at different systems options. Um, if we need to turn around results in 24 hours, we will, full disclosure, we will say, you know, hey, based on our experience, we can tell you that, you know, VRF is gonna save, you know, 25% in annual energy cost. Um, we didn't model it, but you know, here's the results. So, you know, yes, to a certain extent, but you're right. Like, as you get into more exotic projects that have their own unique forms, then like, we have to, we have to make a new model. Like, yeah. does, that, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, like yeah. The, it, I mean, it's, it's an engineering decision and it's sort of a, you know, I guess with more projects and more data, you're that, 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 that sort of percentage of error becomes better and better and better, mm -hmm. you know, because then your, your existing model is you get closer and closer and closer to the project that you're looking at. I mean, for structures, I mean, you know, to be honest, w buildings look very differently, but the metrics at the end of the day need to be like, like developers know what the metric is going to be even before we do an analysis, or else they don't do the building. You know, mm -hmm. so um, so in that sense, you know, if you for certain engineering characteristics, it actually does not change by that order of magnitude. So that's a, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, okay, so for this actually, so I'm going to talk about changing a, a low-rise multifamily building. So again, double-loaded corridors, relatively consistent um, type of building. But uh, lately we've been doing quite a bit of passive house work. Um, has anybody here been involved in a passive house project at all? Raise your hand if yes. 
One, okay. Oh, okay, hey, um, so at least in the Northeast, Fast Pass is blowing up, it's going crazy in New York. Uh, it's really getting a lot of traction. Pacific Northwest is getting a lot of traction. Seems very applicable for Chicago. I know there's at least a few famous passive houses here in Chicago, so wouldn't be surprised if it's on, on its way. Um, but in our experience, I serve on the Passive House U.S. Technical Committee, where we you know, define the standards. We've done, uh, let's see, this is a dormitory for visiting scientists. This is an elementary school. Uh, this is a college dorm. This is mixed use. Um, and this one, this is affordable multifamily. And this is what I'm going to be talking about. Um, okay, so this project, uh, we won Multifamily of the Year last year uh, at the Passive House Conference and also Affordable Project of the Year. Um, here it is built. And it's the largest U.S. cold climate passive house. Out of all of our projects, I mean, this thing is not like exotic architecture. It's pretty, you know, boring. Right? Go ahead and say that. Um, but honestly, out of our whole portfolio, I think I'm most proud of this project. So one of the reasons why is cost. So uh, is anybody here familiar with uh, Governor Paul LePage from Maine? Have you guys heard of that name before? Okay, no, okay. He's kind of kind of crazy. He makes a lot of headlines for saying like really audacious stuff. Um, it seems like Democrats don't like him, Republicans don't like him, like independents don't like him. It's just generally you know, just white. Um, oh, maybe voicemail. What's that? He's not leaving voicemails for people. Yeah, 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 the voicemail guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, yeah really nasty stuff. Um, anyways. He has a rule in the state of Maine where there's a hard cost cap on all affordable housing. So um, he says if you are building this project and um, you know you want to hit net zero and you have some you know millionaire that comes in and says you know I want this project to be net zero too. Here's a million dollars for this project. The state will remove one million dollars from their budget that they're allocating to the project because they say you know come hell or high water. We should not be spending any more money than this on public housing projects. Um, so we had a challenge, uh, and yeah, 48 units, 54,000 gross square feet, uh, dog washing room. Uh, this is located in uh, Brewer, Maine, so about 8,000 heating degree days. It's like uh, between the climate zones of they define it as like it's like um, cold and like very cold. It's like something like that, and we were particularly challenged with this project. Uh, because our principal, Gunnar Hubbard, serves on the Board of Community Housing of Maine, the developer that did this. And they were having a meeting together, uh, talk about this project, kind of a kickoff thing, and uh, Gunnar uh, said to these folks, you, know, you guys should really make this thing a passive house. You know, it's a great opportunity to make this thing a passive house. And if anybody's working in affordable housing, you know, once you're actually talking about a project, it's been designed, it's been budgeted, this thing is set in stone. And so they said to him, they said, you know, this thing's designed, like, can we really turn this thing into a passive house? It seems like it has to be a very integrated design process and all that. And you know, Gunnar says, oh, okay, no problem. Of course we can make this thing into a passive house. Yeah. And so he comes back to me, and I'm like sitting at my desk, and he's like, we have one week to make this thing into a passive house. And I'd never worked on a passive house before, so I was, you know, obviously, you know, we were kind of screwed, um, but uh, we we dove in, and I don't know if there's modelers here, but I didn't know how to use the Passive House software at this point. I ended up using eQuest, which is like a big building modeling software, and like basically tried to game it so it would give us Passive House results. Um, and it was like it, we got enough confidence in a week that you know we kind of give it the green light. You know, yes, we can do this. So uh, first step in this process was we started to look at the wall assemblies that had already been designed. This is like literally, I mean, we got like construction drawings and had to work with how much insulation do we need to add to these walls to hit the passive house standard. Um, and we costed out each one of the examples. And where we ended up with this one was uh, double stud walls, double stud uh, wood frame walls with cellulose in between them. Um, now, if you are in the remain with 8,000 heating degree days when at the peak of winter, it gets like really cold, like you know, minus double digits. Um, and you have double stud wall and cellulose in the middle. Does anybody have any guess like what is something you worry about or something like that? Moisture. It's moisture, right. So, you know, you've got it really cold on the outside, really warm on the inside, and the dew point lives like somewhere in the middle of those two things. So uh, we did some lippy analysis of this wall section, and lo and behold, uh, you know, yellow light, there's like potential for mold growth inside this section. There's a hard cost cap, we can't afford a vapor retarder on this project, so what do we do? Did a little bit of research, and this is actually a good find. We learned that 
craft paper, you know, craft paper, like the big rolls of craft paper that you can like send packages in, um, actually has a perm rating. So uh, we modeled uh, the wall section with 75 pound craft paper, which is like really, really cheap compared. I mean, there's cool products out there like Sega and very cool like Swiss products, very expensive. They're definitely not the same price point as craft paper. Um, we found that literally stapling craft, craft paper inside <coughs> the walls would act as an adequate vapor barrier to resist uh, the vapor transfer and create mold problems. Um, so yeah, there you go, Quality Packaging Corporation. Um, lo and behold, we ended up with this on the inside of the walls. Another quick optimization thing that we found from this whole process was we looked at roof insulation. So the first step was, because we'd never done a pass house before, we looked at their published standards on like, you need to have this in your roof, this in your walls. Um, and they told us, you know, R80 for a roof. Uh, it's typically kind of like a small building standard. Uh, where some of these rule of thumb metrics were based off of. Put it on a big building and all of a sudden we were like, okay, we're saving about $670 in annual energy costs with the extra R20. Uh, it's costing us $30,000 in the first place. Um, so from that simple payback, it's a no brainer to get rid of it. But where it got really interesting was we looked at the global warming potential of different types of insulation. Mm -hmm. So this is cellulose, low cellulose on the left. This is extruded polystyrene on the right. Um, this is global warming potential. And you can see like extruded polystyrene is in like banana land over there. Um, we were at the time holding extruded polystyrene <laughs> on the roof. And so we did a quick calculation of how many years of building operation it would take to pay off the embodied carbon associated with that extra insulation. How long would that building need to operate? How long would those savings pay off? And it was about 1,400 years of building operations for that savings to pay off, um, which was a really interesting finding for us, right? I mean, the, there's like a funny thing with insulation where sometimes we think of insulation as almost like a moral thing, like more insulation is better, like period, end of story. Um, but, you know, once we're digging in a little bit more, realizing that's only part of the part of the equation, right, is the right amount of insulation is, um, I guess, the lowest environmental footprint when you look at it. Uh, so anyways, uh, just moving through this pass house process on this project, we had, you know, a billion MEP meetings. Um, you think with the passive house, you're getting the loads low enough, the MEP systems would be like really simple. Um, we had like literally four months of MEP meetings with four engineers at the table trying to design this stupid microscopic system that doesn't cost anything. Um, but lo and behold, it worked. Uh, we ended up doing, you guys heard of like Amer 11's tunneling through the cost barrier. Um, you know, it never works. Like tunneling through the cost barrier, like it just gets more and more expensive and then, you know, an outside funder comes in and pays for it. But actually in this example, it worked. So we got the, the we built up the whole envelope. Here's the additive cost increase of all these different envelope pieces. And lo and behold, we ended up putting electric resistance heat into each one of these apartments. So passive house is a metric in Brewer, Maine, uses approximately one third of a hair dryer per apartment to heat the apartment. So why not just put a little stick of electric resistance baseboard in there, um, huge for us cost savings, and we basically net it out on the cost of the project. So it worked, which is, which is big for us. Uh, just moving quickly through the passive house process. Um, this is, let's see, uh, the next step was my wife at the time, uh, well, she's still my wife, I said my wife at the time. <laughs> uh, my current wife. Uh, she's not here, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, she, uh, so at the time she had an air testing company, so she did like enclosure testing, um, blower door testing, and went through, she we actually hired her, she's working for our envelope. Uh, services now doing like envelope commissioning um, and we found 19 thermal bridges so we review like every last little freaking detail um, of this thing and say okay here's an issue we need to address insulating uh, this specific area um, and then you know regular groundbreaking nation work framing work um, and as mentioned we've got a whole detailed presentation <laughs> fall over out of boredom uh, hour and a half thing on this that I'd be happy to share with you guys at some point to tell you how we kind of got into the nitty-gritty of Passive House um, but here it is totally built, um, air sitting, and another cool thing about it is there's a fair amount of testing involved with Passive House in order to meet the standard, you actually need to test the physical building. So here's insulation inspections, making sure that insulation was installed properly. Here's thermal imaging, looking if there's anything that you need to take account for in the model when you revise the model afterwards. Uh, here's my wife and I testing the HVAC system. 
Oh, and um, this is also another critical component of Passive House in terms of air tightness. It's all around the site. We put these signs that say, um, if you were going to poke a hole in this building, talk to the super. Um, and it's particularly effective. Because uh, as a, I'll talk about in a sec, the, the air tightness standard is extremely stringent. And uh, this is uh, CHOM Community Housing Domains portfolio. And this is where Village Center ended up on it, again, with uh, little to no cost increase. And, you know, to be fair, we, it was actually it was a 3% cost increase on that project. Um, that is more or less a wash. If you think about Brewer, Maine, like way up north, the cost of construction is already so low that when you add anything onto it, it shows up as like a significant number. If you did this project in you know, Chicago or outside of Chicago or any place that basically has kind of more expensive buildings to start with, it would be negligible. You just fold into the project budget. Um, okay, so anyways, back to what I want to talk about originally. Um, one year ago now, Thorne Thomas Eddy moved me from Maine uh, to San Francisco. So now I run our Western Region Building Analytics Group. And I was like, my wife and I have all this awesome past house experience. Like, shit, what are we going to do with that? Like, we're in San Francisco, you know, we're like 3,000 degree, degree days. Um, so uh, I was interested in seeing what would happen if we moved the building to San Francisco. What, what happens then, right? This is the change the parameters of the existing model part. And uh, we had been working with Design Explorer quite a bit at that point. So we said, you know, instead of hooking up these Energy Plus and DASIM simulations to Design Explorer, what happens if we take the Excel-based PHPP model and write macros so it runs batch simulations and visualize those results in the parallel coordinates? interface. And so we got this to run, uh, we built macros for it, and it runs 15,000 combinations of uh, windows, of walls, of solar heat gain coefficient, of HVAC choices, that you can see here. Um, I'm not going to lie, like, when you load up 15,000 results, like, when you try to stripe it, it crawls. So, like, I sped the video up a little bit so you don't have to, like, wait through it kind of chugging through. Um, what we did was, here's all those inputs. So, wall insulation, roof, window, solar heat gain coefficient, ventilation, heat exchanger, air tightness of the building, south shade depth, and then over here uh, you have all the passive house metrics. Um, your annual heating metric, your peak heating metric, and then primary energy over here. Um, Quick question, what are the different metrics for the, uh, the different parameters for your ventilation heat exchanger? Is that just effectiveness? Yeah, it's just effectiveness. Um, it's a little hard to see. I think this is 90%, this is 75%, this is no heat exchanger at all. Um, and then what this allowed us to do was basically, you know, if you want to do a passive house, a multi, you know, three-story or lower passive house in uh, San Francisco, you know, basically you strike below what the requirements are, and lo and behold, you end up with a formula of all different stuff that you can select from to get there. Um, so you can, of course, we actually haven't hooked up price to this one yet, but you can associate price with each one of those. So you can do this for as cheap as possible, and I'm actually confident that if we had this tool when we did the original Brewer project, we could have gotten it even even cheaper than, than we had it. Um, now, where this gets interesting is, um, are you, how many folks here are familiar with uh, California Energy Code at all? If I say, how many people have heard of Title 24 before? Oh, good, okay. Um, so <laughs> in 2020, uh, they're, you know, which is like what, two, two years, three years away, something like that. Um, there is going to be a requirement that all three-story residential buildings, three stories and lower, um, will need to be net zero. Like every single one of them in the state of California will need to be net zero. Um, and so some architects know about this, some don't know about this, um, but it's going to be a challenge. Um, I wanted to figure out how much of a challenge it's going to be. So here in San Francisco, what we did, or not here, but you know what I'm saying, in, there in San Francisco, um, we have this chart that we usually use. On the bottom is PV watts per square foot. So uh, how much energy can your PV system generate? Uh, on the y-axis is energy use intensity in kBTUs per square foot, so EUI. And what this allows us to do is, oh, I'll get this thing. Um, this is a typical range for PV output in terms of like what you can buy off the shelf. There's like more exotic stuff out there, but this is a typical range. Um, if you walk this back, you can see what EUI you would need to hit on the building below the PVs in order to produce all the electricity on the rooftop um, to 
make up for it. So we did the same study, and so yeah, so the other thing here um, was with my wife as an enclosure specialist, uh, she's been doing um, uh, inspections around San Francisco, uh, building enclosures, how tight they are, how insulation is installed, and generally there's this kind of, this like idea that it doesn't really matter in San Francisco, that you can have a leaky building in San Francisco because it's temporary because it doesn't get that cold. Um, I can tell you from personal experience, we moved into a 1920s bungalow that we just had air sealed, and it makes a huge difference in terms of like whether you're warm or not. But I wanted to know from an energy perspective, what is the impact of tightening up your building? Um, so what I did was I ran here, let me pause this for a sec. Um, here is that net zero energy number over here in terms of EUI. And this is like kind of funky, a lot of what we see in San Francisco construction, six air changes per hour. So, and just for clarification's sake, that's not six air changes per hour like a lab building where you're like running your ventilation system six air, air changes per hour. This is at 50 Pascal. So this is pressurized air change in case anybody's like, what does that ever mean? Um, four air changes per hour is like, um, that's a pretty good construction. That's where most construction probably should be. Uh, two air changes per hour is when you're having meetings with the contractors about air sealing. There's air sealing details built in. Um, you're not going for any exotic standard, but that's like a solid contractor. And 0.6 is the passive house requirement. So you need to get to 0.6 air changes per hour. And if we run this thing, so we go from six air changes per hour. So if you watch the EUI over here, we're gonna go from six to four. And now the UI drops here. We go from four to two. And the UI drops here. This is what the video sped up to. Uh, if we go to passive house, we've got a split right here. And if you go over here and you take care of your heat exchanger, you do mechanical ventilation or heat recovery. And all of a sudden, almost every option over on that side can potentially get you to a net zero building. Exciting, right? I mean, it's a temperate climate, so you don't need to have exotic amounts of insulation. You follow code compliance and you build a tight building. There's a formula right there. It's actually not that bad. Now, the risky thing about this is if that's for code compliance, you don't want to rely on a contractor's execution for whether your building is a legal building or not, right? Um, as a design team, probably on this side, you want to start looking at you know, optimizing your insulation so you can take care of some of the load, doing better windows, doing heat exchangers so you can take care of some of that load so you're not totally dependent on the contractor doing a good job. But it's a really interesting argument for, I've been using it to talk with the city and say, hey, you know, you should really start offering free training uh, to contractors in terms of how to build an airtight building because they don't quite know how to do it yet. But with the stuff coming up in two years, it would be a big help. Uh, okay. Uh, so that's, that's it. That was the, the, the pool building side of it and uh, box walling side of it. And yeah, so thank you. Let me know if you have any questions. Um, could you go back to that slide on insulation as to the, uh, like how... Um, the GWP? The, uh, uh, the uh, amount of um, embodied. embodied carbon yeah. uh, in the insulation. I'm just curious, was cellular glass in there? Uh, fiberglass bat is no, down here. No. Cellular a, glass? So there's an uh, insulation called cellular glass. I don't know. What, what is it? Um, it looks black. It's made of glass beads. Yeah. It, it has a high compressive strength. Hmm. But um, the R value per inch is not, not real high. It's probably about equivalent with uh, uh, the. Um, Maybe you're uh, you're in, in the middle of the road there. Um, oh, like uh, fiberglass bat. Uh, what, what's the other one? Okay. Uh, rock oh. wool stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so well, it, you know, I bet you it'd, it'd be a lot better. It'd probably be on like this end of it. The reason why these are so bad is because a lot of board insulation, like you know, board insulation gets its R value because there's pockets of air in there, and the way they create the pockets of air is by taking refrigerant and blowing it in there. So they use the same refrigerants that, you know, you hear all like the UN doing like the banning about like HRCs and stuff like that. And the problem is that stuff leaks out of the atmosphere and the global warming impact of that stuff is like carbon times a thousand. So 
if that product no. is not like a blown product, no, no, it's then it would be you know, probably on that end. You know, why is this tree polystyrene so bad? That's the reason because it's they use um, refrigerants to expand it, um, and those refrigerants leak out in the atmosphere. In the manufacturing process, they get out in the atmosphere. So, um, yeah, and you know, they <coughs> go out and they uh, let's see. So I always forget. So do they degrade the ozone, or do they create the layer around that keeps? The, I think it's heat trapping. I think the ozone depleting ones were outlawed, but I think now. The problem is the ones that trap heat in. Mm -hmm. so. is, is there sort of a similar issue with the other uh, spray? The, um, yeah, SPF. Oh. Um, spray foam, yeah, traditionally has been really bad. Um, so Dow is now making what they call like a low GWP board. So they're claiming their XPS has a lower carbon footprint than it used to. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem is, is their formula for that stuff is proprietary. That's their competitive advantage. So they don't share that. So like, you know, folks like me or you guys can't do the numbers for ourselves to see what the actual global warming impact of it is. So, you know, we're kind of taking their word for it at this point. Um, but, you know, for this project, we ended up going to uh, polyisocyanurate for the rooftop, um, which is much more modest uh, global warming potential. But, you know, and the reality is, is well, two things. Um, one, keep in mind with this graph, with this 1,400 years to pay off, um, insulation is diminishing returns, right? We're talking going from R80 to R60. So if you're talking about going from like R15 to R10, it's going to pay off a lot sooner because insulation at lower R values is a lot more effective. Um, but when we're talking about super insulated buildings here, the takeaway is that it's the right amount of insulation, not the passive house has been traditionally been all about super insulation, so they're going to back off on that, or it's it's not necessarily like so. That's the cool thing. So um, passive house US, what they did is, do you guys know Beoft? Are you familiar with that software at all? It's like an optimization software, and what they did was they took all different climate zones and they ran you know, the same like bajillion models, and they optimized it for cost and they optimized it for global warming potential and all that stuff and. The new metrics, so the FIUS, PHIUS, Passive House Institute US metrics, are actually based on those optimized results. So um, they've, it's not the, the hope, like super insulated buildings that you should really think about. It's more of an optimized building now. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. Just a question for you. You showed um, that example of the, the house in Maine, yep. the multifamily in Maine, that you would use the uh, design explorer with. Yeah. And so then you would use passive houses, Excel based tool, and use a bunch of macros to generate your large format data set. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then so you were using presumably Honeybee and sort of like the grasshopper batch for the single sort of, sort of box model yes. to create your massive data sets. Do you have like a process for creating batch data sets for whole village models using something that's not Excel based? Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. So um, we're we're working on that now. So what we're doing is um, we're developing uh, stuff for eQuest. So you can do that. The problem with eQuest, if you're an eQuest user, is that um, you know eQuest has parametric simulation functions, but you have to basically manually write each one of those. You can't just say like, here's five parameters. Give me all the options. Um, so we're writing that. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to give that one away. Um, I was actually trying to build like a like a multi-family model. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we do yeah. all work on it, but not not like there's such a thing as like I don't think so. I mean, like the visualizer is what we give away. Like anybody can upload anything into it. Um, we'll, we'll see how it goes. But we're working on it right now, um, and we're also uh, for this is not necessarily relevant here, but for Title Twenty Four, um, the CEC California Energy Commission has their own modeling protocol. So we're trying to build a batch process for that too. So it's essentially like a batch calling parametric tool for calling. That like outputs the CSV that this thing likes. Cool. Basically, yeah. Did you ever get to work in construction documents or construction phase, or did you guys just stop at DB? Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely, definitely, yeah. So we we work in the construction documents phase. Um, yeah, you know, uh, for whole building modeling, like for these presentations, like just show like the kind of fancy stuff that's like fun to look at. Like we do a lot of like models modeling, lead modeling that 
do well into that phase. Um, we don't use a lot of the flashy tools in those phases. Usually the building's pretty set. But I think like, one really cool application for this would be in the value engineering process when you know, you've got to make hard decisions about cost and the implications of it. So if you could optimize these solutions in this, not only have energy stuff, but like have all the other things that you have to trade off in the building, um, I think it could be a, a neat application. Got a follow up to that. Yeah. With, of the projects your group works on, what percentage would you say you get hired early enough to do this sort of work? Well, more and more, to be honest. Um, I think probably like a robust 20%. Okay. Yeah, and I, I think you know, and I've I've presented many times with, I mean, not just on the sustainability side, but structures as well. We like to get involved as early as possible because that that's when these tools become that much more powerful. Uh, powerful. If you wait too long, then your options starts to diminish really quickly. Um, so, yeah. so we pitch that. I mean, we 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 are a proponent of that. It doesn't change our fee at all. In fact, it makes I think a better design. That's that's what we propose. Yeah. So you don't build from the two other things separately? <laughs> no, it's, that's included. I mean, you know, to be honest, if we get involved too late, like your past pilot project, yeah. it actually makes it harder uh, to implement a lot of this. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we actually charge more. For, <laughs> it's not true. We should. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> All right. Any other questions for Colin and Robert? Well, we appreciate you guys coming to Chicago. I uh, want to highlight for the people that uh, weren't here at the beginning that we're also holding another event tomorrow at Loyola. Uh, we're having David Orr, uh, climate scientist, author, and educator. Um, it's going to be over at the, uh, the Schreiber Center just a few blocks away. It'll be at 530. It'll be drinks and appetizers. Uh, if you're interested, RSVP at rsvp at scv.com. Sorry, one last thing. Is Absolutely. That Design Explorer tool, if you just search Design Explorer in Google, um, you can pull it up. There's an info tab that you can click on, and it has like tutorials, and it has the instructions on how you can use it. Um, so, but if you guys are messing it with it, I, my card's right here. Please email me and tell me like what you did with it, because I want to know. Yeah, and uh, to add to that, um, the um, as part of the last hackathon, actually, we've updated the, the tool that can get that data more easily from Grasshopper into the CSV. Um, it's called Calibri, um, and it's available from um, uh, GitHub. Well, GitHub, yes, but 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 uh, from, if you go to Food for Rhino website um, and you go to the Thornton Thomas Society TP toolbox, the whole suite of tools is there as part of that package, so it's for free. So. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you.